First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Um, I'm interested in doing some work for the library. Are you the person to speak to? Yes. Right. Well, um, what sort of work are you interested in? Well, I've just come to live here in Australia. I don't want a full-time job until my children have settled down, but I really need to get out of the house a bit. And I heard you need voluntary workers for various projects. Right. But I don't know if I have the right skills. Well, we do provide training. Oh. We always include an orientation to the library, together with emergency procedures. That's fire regulations, emergency exits, first aid so you can cope with accidents or sudden illness. Things like that which are necessary for anyone who's working with the public. Then we give specialist training for particular projects, like using our database system. I do have quite good computer skills, in fact. Oh, great. Is there any sort of uh, dress requirement? Well, all staff have to wear a name badge, so they can be identified if they go outside the staff-only areas. But apart from that, there aren't many regulations. We ask you to sign in and sign out for insurance purposes, but that's all. How about transport? Do you live locally? Well, not too far away. I'm at Porpoise Beach. My husband needs a car during the day, but it's only about 20 minutes on the bus. In fact, we can reimburse part of your travel expenses in that case. Oh! Would that be the same if I came by car? No, uh, because parking is such a problem here. One thing we are looking for, though, is someone who can drive a minibus. No problem. So, do the projects involve going outside the library? Some, yes, but not all. We've just finished one which involved working with photographs taken of the area 50 or 100 years ago. It basically involved what we call encapsulation. Putting them in some sort of covers to keep them safe? Exactly. <laughs> it's time-consuming work and we were very grateful to have help with it. Then, sometime next year, we're hoping to begin working on an initiative involving the sorting and labelling of objects relating to local history. We'll be needing help with the cataloguing. Well, I'd definitely be interested. How about at present? Well, we have a small team who work to support those who are unable to read. Working with the blind? Yes, or other groups who have reading difficulties. We provide volunteers with equipment so that they can take books home with them and read them aloud onto CDs. We're gradually building up a collection that can be lent to those who need them. Hmm, I can see it would be useful, but I'd really like to do some sort of work where I can get the chance to meet people. How about reading stories to children? Mm, that's done by our regular staff. But we do have another project... It's a very long established scheme which involves helping those who are unable to have direct access to the library. Oh, I noticed someone with a trolley of books when I was at the hospital last week. That sort of thing. That would have been one of ours, yes. It's one of our most popular services. Lots of people who wouldn't dream of going to the library normally or when they're at home borrow a book when the trolley comes round the ward. I can imagine. <laughs> Yes, I'd definitely be interested in that. Right, so how do I enrol? Well, we do ask all volunteers to commit themselves to a regular period each week. I could probably do five or six hours. Oh, be careful not to take on too much. But we do need someone for a couple of afternoons from two to four. So four hours altogether. That sounds fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation...
Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Right, so here's the application form. It asks the usual questions, name and address and telephone number. You also need to fill in details of who we should get in touch with in case of any accident or problem like that. Uh, we do need to have that filled in. And there's a space for date of birth, but that's only if you're over 75, so uh, we won't worry about that. No. <laughs> oh, it asks for qualifications. Do I need to provide certificates? They're not necessary. We'll need the names of two referees, not relatives or family members, obviously. Uh, what else? Signature of parent or guardian. <laughs> that won't be necessary, as I assume you're over 18. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's this? It says civil conviction check. That's a document we have to provide by law for those working on projects involving children, so we won't need it in your case. But you will need to sign this separate document. That's a, a copy of commitment. It's basically an agreement to work according to the library guidelines. So, if you'd like to fill this all in, uh, you can do it here or take it home, whichever you prefer. I'll take it home if that's OK. Right, well, thank you for your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a telephone conversation about a job vacancy. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, Top Job Employment Agency. Ellen Sykes speaking. How can I help you? Good morning. My name's Steve Collins and I'm calling about the call centre job advertised in today's paper. For an operative handling credit card inquiries? Yes, that's right. The wages and working conditions are all in the ad, so what I'd like to know now is what the work actually consists of. I should explain that I'm a student looking for a summer job, not long-term employment. That's OK. The people at Intercard say they've always found students to be honest, which of course is essential in this line of work, and they have the basic IT skills needed there. Apparently, there have been a few who didn't find it easy to get there on time in the morning, but in most cases, their punctuality is as good as anybody else's. Anyway, about the work. And I know a bit about this because, as it happens, I've worked there myself. Really? Yes, for about a year. You'd find that most callers would be people wanting to check the balance on their cards, query payments made and so on. And from those who've had their cards stolen? No, they ring another number for that, an emergency line. People also call that number if they lose their cards. And what are most callers like? I mean, what kind of people are they? All sorts, really. All ages, every kind of background. Though one definite trend is the change in the number of women. Nowadays, they make up around 55% of the total, whereas years ago, there used to be a majority of men calling. At one time, I heard, as many as three quarters of all credit cards were actually held by men, but that must have been long before I was there. It's certainly different now. So to do this job, what sort of experience do I need? None, really. Have you got a credit card yourself? Yes, I have. Then you probably know quite a bit about them already. 
and as a student you're obviously intelligent, which of course you need to be for the job. So after a day or so working with an experienced operative, I'm sure you'll have picked up enough to deal with routine inquiries, which of course most of them are. But there are bound to be questions I can't deal with, at least at first. What happens then? In that case, you can ask a supervisor. They're very helpful to new staff. I think I like the sound of this. What do I do next? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Can you get over there for 9.45 on Monday morning for an interview? Definitely, yes. Whereabouts are they? In Riverside Business Park. Do you know it? Yes, I've been there once. How do you usually travel? By bus. Right. So you take either the 136 or 137 to the bus station... And when you come out of there, you turn right. Along Orchard Road, that is. The road from the railway station? Yes, that's right. You go past the petrol station next to the car dealers, then carry on down the road. Do I take the first left at the main car park? Well, you could do that and walk up Newfield Avenue alongside the shopping centre, but it's a long way round. I'd suggest continuing along Orchard Road with the water company and then the insurance offices on your right. They used to be local government offices, by the way. Yes, I remember those. And you keep going until you reach the advertising agency. Now, facing that is a small road called Cherry Lane. There's a newspaper office on the corner, and opposite that is a big hotel, so you can't miss it. And how far down that road is it? Well, they aren't actually in Cherry Lane. You walk as far as the next junction and turn right into Armand Drive at the mail centre. Intercard is in the third building on the right between the airline offices and the shipping company. Fine. I'll be there on Monday. Thanks very much. Bye. Good luck. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a student, Aldo, and his supervisor, Dr. Hurst, about his research assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 23. So, Aldo, how's it going so far with your assignment? Not too bad. You're looking at the community round here. That's right. How people perceive the community they are in. Have you made much progress? Hmm. I conducted quite a lot of interviews on the street with local residents their responses are interesting. I haven't got quite as many yet as I'd like. I had wondered if I'd have language problems, particularly with the different accents. 
I seem to have managed, though. Having to work in the open has made it harder, and with the cold weather there's been recently, people don't necessarily want to stop and talk like they do if it's nice and sunny. That's something I've had to deal with. Of course, some people are too busy to stop and talk, but that's OK. I see. So, have you formed a good overall picture of how people view the community? To an extent. I've certainly talked to plenty of older people. I guess they may have more time to talk. I still don't really have enough young mothers, though. I've managed to get enough older mothers and children through the schools. That's something I had been worried about. Well, that shouldn't be too hard. Now, how are you going to deal with all the data you've collected? That's the difficult part. I guess I need to run some analyses, but I'm rather unclear about what methods to use. You've told me you're confident about using computers, so you just need some input on choosing programmes. You should attend a statistics seminar. They're held every Friday after the methodology seminars in room 105. That should help you to select an approach. Oh, good. I'll do that. Now you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Meanwhile, let's hear something about what you've learned. Yes, I talked to a number of residents. Good. I imagine they didn't always have the same opinions. Views were certainly quite mixed. Take sports facilities. In general, people seemed to think they weren't very good. There's no swimming pool in the area, for example. But at the same time, there's a new football training area. It looks very smart to me, but it doesn't seem to get used very much. People seem to prefer sitting around in the parks. They enjoy that, taking picnics and so on. Although they want the council to be more efficient at cleaning, there's a lot of litter. People are obviously very concerned about their children's learning. The general view seems to be that early schooling at primary level is of a good standard in the area, but that this standard declines as children move up through the system. The colleges were criticised in particular. OK. Now, are you going to collect any more data? Some, I hope. There's a local festival next week, and I think the events there will give me some useful opportunities. I talked to a council officer about it all. Good. What does it involve? First, there's a dance show, which I'm sure I'll enjoy. The council explained that the concert hall's being renovated and won't be ready in time, so it's being held in the main square, which I think will be better anyway. At least I'll have more space to wander around in. True. And so I hope to be able to carefully watch the age groups that are there in the audience and make notes about how they interact. So that's one event. Then, the following day, there's another interesting event which I look forward to going along to, and that's a cookery competition. Oh, yes. Interesting. I think so. Yes, that one's being organised in the town hall, which has a big space, apparently. With food and cooking from all the different people in the area, the council officer told me that it'll be a good chance to find out about the different cultures that make up the community. Sounds promising. Then there's one more event I'd like to go along to. The council officer promised me that the courses fair will be interesting. It's going to be in the Langtree Theatre, and the officer said lots of teachers will be there. I've already talked to plenty of them, but he advised me to put some questions to the head of education, who will also be there. That's all very useful. OK, I suggest you come back next week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a wildlife expert giving a talk to a group of bird lovers in the UK about a species called the tawny owl. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening, everyone. You're all likely to be familiar with pictures of the tawny owl, because of all the owl species in the UK, it's actually the most common one. But the chances are that you're more likely to have heard one than actually seen one, as it's also strongly nocturnal. This means that it normally ventures out at night. So, what kind of habitats does the tawny owl prefer? Well, a survey carried out in the 1980s confirmed that this owl is most likely to be found in woodland. If you look at a map of tawny owl distribution across Britain, you'll only see gaps in the treeless, marshy areas of eastern England, and in some of the more upland parts of northwest Scotland. However, You can sometimes find populations of tawny owls in urban areas too, either in parks or in large gardens. The tawny owl shows some obvious adaptations to its natural habitat. For example, both its wings and its tail are short, which helps it to manoeuvre through the trees. Also, the bird's plumage is a mixture of brown and grey. And this provides suitable camouflage for when the owl perches up against a tree trunk. Then there are its large eyes. The tawny owl's visual capacities are considerably better than those of humans, and although it can't see in complete darkness, it's sufficiently well equipped to be able to navigate its way around woodland on all but the most overcast nights. Another factor that contributes to the tawny owl's success as a hunter is its excellent memory of the layout of different areas. If you combine this ability with the owl's strongly territorial and sedentary nature, most populations of tawny owl are sit and wait predators. You realize that it has a good opportunity to predict where prey might be found. Finally, as well as having large eyes. The owl's sense of hearing is excellent, and this helps it to locate potential prey as it sits on its perch. Turning now to the tawny owl's diet, woodland tawny owls feed mainly on mammals, especially small ones such as wood mice and bank voles, but they'll also take things like frogs or bats or even fish. If they happen to be available, in urbanised landscapes, the owls seem to prey more on birds. So there are some differences there. Let's just look briefly now at survival rates in the tawny owl. Young tawny owls face a difficult time once they leave home, and two out of every three are likely to die within their first year. So with such high mortality levels. It's a good job that established breeding pairs can produce young over a number of seasons and maximise their chances of passing their genes on to the next generation of owls. I've already mentioned the sedentary nature of the tawny owl, but it's not just adult tawny owls that are sedentary in their habits. Young birds, dispersing away from where they were born, rarely move far. The average distance is just four kilometers. There also appears to be some reluctance to cross large bodies of water, 
The owl is absent from many of the islands around our shores, with only occasional sightings in Ireland and the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. Right, well, now I'll show you some photographs that have been taken in one or two of the... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.